Would you rise in body or in spirit and join in singing hymn 203 in the gray hymnal, All Creatures of the Earth and Sky, hymn number 203. Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Ann Arbor, Michigan, a liberal religious community of justice seekers in the heart of Treetown. My name is Stella Anderson, my pronouns are she, her, and I serve this congregation as the Director of Spiritual Growth and Development. Whether you're joining us in person, tuning in on the live stream, or watching on demand at a later time, we hope you feel safe, welcome, and connected. For the first timers among us, we warmly invite you to attend a newcomer welcome right after the service in the Redmond Room, which is the second door on your left as you head back towards the main entrance. We're here to answer questions and help you navigate your way through our energetic, enthusiastic community. You can also fill out a newcomer survey, which is available on our website at uuaa.org slash newcomer survey. To the first timers, the long timers, 
and everyone that's in between. Your presence in body and in spirit is a gift. Where in the world is Reverend Manish? <laughs> Our senior minister is on the road again this Sunday. He's currently in Poland with the board of our denomination's International Human Rights Organization, the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, as part of a mission supporting refugees that have fled the war in Ukraine. While we miss him here in Ann Arbor, we are grateful for the important work that UUSC supports, and he will be back very soon. <clears throat> we continue to celebrate our worship season of awakening on this chilly and yet now sunny Earth Day morning. The weather is warming, sort of. The flowers are beginning to bloom, and the trees are emerging from months of rest and slumber and rejuvenation. After the service today, please visit the social hall for a variety of Earth Day crafts and activities, including a walk among the trees, as we honor our seventh UU principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence, of which we are a part. It starts with a seed, a poem by Laura Knowles. It starts with a seed. But where does it lead? To a root, to a shoot, to a few tiny leaves. As days turn to weeks, the seedling has grown. It's a dragonfly perch, a ladybug thrown. But it wants to grow bigger. It yearns to climb high, pushing down through the soil, stretching up to the sky. How can something so small turn into a tree, which is such an incredibly big thing to be? It takes many seasons, fall, summer, and spring. With each passing year, the trunk builds a new ring. Strong branches reach out, they give shelter and shade, a home where the animals don't feel afraid. Even in winter, when the leaves have all dropped, the tree is asleep, but life hasn't stopped. It is waiting for spring, for the warmth of the sun, when buds burst from branches, what color, what fun. It's not just a tree but a wonderful world full of beetles and grubs and squirrels and birds, all busily making a life of their own in their lead-laden, bark-bound, arboreal home. The seeds are now ready to float in the breeze, and some of them might just grow into new trees. We are gathered in community. We are gathered for worship. Last week, I was a guest in the class the congregation holds for those who are interested in becoming new members. Stella's call to worship reminded me of that class, or rather the people in the class. It starts with a seed, but where does it lead? Each person in that class is now holding the seed of Unitarian Universalism, and in time, it may lead to membership and more involvement in the congregation. A lot of things are covered in that class, but among them are discussions of what it means to be Unitarian Universalist and what it means to be part of this community. The next two things we do in this service are foundational elements of this faith tradition and of this congregation. The first is lighting the chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, the flame representing truth, love, action, peace, and some say the divine spark that is within each of us. The second thing we do is our covenant. Now, if you are watching on live stream and have a candle or a chalice nearby, I invite you to get that ready and light it along with us. And if you'd like, you can share in the chat where the chalice is lit. I'd like to ask Stella to help us light the chalice this morning in the sanctuary. And as she does, let us say together our chalice lighting words. Together, let us say, we light this chalice for the light of truth. We light this chalice for the warmth of love. We light this chalice for the energy of action. We light this chalice for the harmony of peace. Thank you. And as I mentioned, the second foundational element of Unitarian Universalism is our covenant. 
This is a faith that is not based on a common creed, on one single belief statement. It became very clear to those in the new member class that we are a people who hold many beliefs, or some say no belief, yet we are drawn together in a common faith tradition. Rather than a creed, we show how we are in relationship with each other and the world through the promises we make to each other, knowing that as humans, we will not always live up to our covenant. The beautiful thing is that we will begin again in love. We have faith that the seeds of love will continue to grow and flourish, so we work at it. Now, whether you are joining us for the very first time or whether you have these words memorized, all are welcome to say the words of our covenant together. Will you join me? The spirit of this church is love, and service is its law. This is our covenant with each other, to dwell together in peace, to search for truth in love, and to help one another. Thank you. I would invite you to stand as you're comfortably willing and able and join in singing the words to hymn number 377 in our gray hymnal. They'll be on the screens in front of you, and the tune, I suspect, is familiar. Number 377, In Greening Lands, begins the song. to have this ugly privacy fence that provided a buffer between my neighbors and their driver driveway and my family in our backyard. The wood was painted bright red, always dirty, muddy, and the bottom of the fence was more than a foot off the ground so I could see the neighbor's car tires on the driveway and see their feet walking around, but we could not see our neighbors to have a simple, quick conversation because it was also too high. It wasn't right. So when Costco had Arbor Vitae for sale, it was goodbye, weird, dirty red fence, hello, skinny green Christmas trees. I planted a dozen of them, not an easy task, let me tell you, and I named each one of them after the 12 days of Christmas song. Five golden rings was especially sturdy and lovely. That first year, we had to regularly water and check to be sure each tree was fed well and got enough sun. But after a couple of years, when we cared for them, those trees started caring for us. They provided shade, a bit of coolness, a wonderful backyard border, and a way for us to talk to our neighbors by gently pulling back the branches and having a friendly conversation. The trees created nest material and a hiding place for the birds and a noise dampener for the freeway. Those trees made me feel that when I was outside in the patio that I was hanging with nature. When a storm came and this bit on our big maple tree dropped a huge branch on a couple of the trees, I ran out to the yard and I cried, oh, my poor drooping babies. Seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, oh. It was so upsetting. I did what I could to prop up the trees and put them back together by attaching them together. We have a relationship, those trees and I. They take care of me, and I take care of them, and our connection sustains all of us. That's what interdependence means. Our time for all ages story this morning is 
trees make perfect pets. Words by Paul Zajac, pictures by Kathy Gendron. Birthdays are the best days for wishes, and on this birthday, Abigail wished for a pet. Her brother wanted a dog, their man's best friend. Her father suggested a hamster. They're so fluffy. Her mom thought a bird would be nice. They make beautiful music. Abigail had another idea. I want a tree. A what? They all gasped. A tree. They're the greatest pets in the world. But a tree isn't a pet, Mom argued. Of course it is, Abigail said. It's quiet, easy to take care of, and can you name another pet that actually helps you breathe? Her family was stumped. Abigail ran to the car. Let's go adopt a tree. Abigail reached the nursery and found her tree. He looks friendly. It's a tree. They're all friendly, her brother said. I'll name you Fido. You and I are going to be best friends. Abigail and Fido were always together. Shouldn't trees sleep outside, her father asked. Fido would be lonely without me. Abigail, Abigail took good care of Fido. She watered him, sang to him. They loved going on long walks. What are you doing? Her neighbor asked. I'm taking Fido for a walk. That's a tree. Trees don't go for walks. This one does. He's my pet. A tree is not a good pet. Cats are much better. Oprah whiskers can cuddle. Fido loves a good hug. Oprah whiskers can do tricks. Stay, Fido. Good boy. Oprah whiskers keeps me warm at night. Fido keeps me cool during the day. Hmm. Have it your way, her neighbor said, but a tree isn't a real pet. Abigail took Fido to the dog park. She knew it was important for pets to socialize, but some didn't agree. I'm sorry, this park is for dogs. Fido is a dogwood. That doesn't count. He's very friendly. His bark is worse than his bite. Sorry, actual pets only. Abigail didn't care what other people thought of Fido. She didn't mind that Fido couldn't go where other pets could. She didn't mind that Fido was only good at fetching kites and didn't like to give them back. She didn't mind that he sometimes had accidents. None of that mattered because Fido was her pet. But like all pets, Fido grew. Walks became more difficult. Fido was a tight fit in her room at night, and the breakfast table became crowded. There are leaves in my cereal again. Honey, Fido's too big to live in the house. He needs a permanent home, her mom said. But Fido is my friend. Where would he live? Outside. A tree belongs in the ground her father explained. Abigail's heart broke. Fido had grown too big for the house. Keeping him inside was not fair to him. 
She found a sunny spot in the yard and dug him a new home, but Abigail wasn't ready to let go. Worried that Fido felt scared and alone, Abigail kept him company under the stars. When morning came, Abigail wake up, woke up to birds singing, Mom, Dad, come quick! Her family rushed out outside to see what the commotion was. Fido made new friends! I guess a tree can be man's best friend, her brother said. Abigail hugged Fido. A tree is everyone's best friend. Dear friends, once a month we take a moment to hear from one of the many social justice groups this congregation supports. These are important moments to pay attention to. The groups highlighted all contribute to this congregation's vision and priority areas. Can you name the priority areas? Climate, Climate justice. I heard radical welcome. Anti-oppression, anti-racism work, yes. This morning, it is my pleasure to introduce Lissa Oliver, who will be sharing the work of the UU Civs Group. Will you welcome Lissa? Hello, everyone. UU Civs is the civic engagement group here at UUAA, and in honor of Earth Day, I would like to say, vote for the Earth. The power of voting and engaging with our elected leaders on issues we care about should never be underestimated. For example, you may remember in 2022, UU Civs, Kaleidoscope, and Restorative Justice were in the social hall gathering signatures on several statewide petitions. And our collective work mattered. The proposals to expand voting rights and protect reproductive freedom passed. This year is another consequential election year, so if you'll indulge me, I'd like to do some early nonpartisan polling. Raise your hands if you plan to vote in August and November. All right. Who thinks they will vote in person on election day? Okay. Who will vote with an absentee ballot? Wow. Okay. And who will vote in person early? Unfortunately, communities of color in Michigan still face obstacles to voting. Misinformation, economic barriers, and political challenges are often designed to prevent underrepresented communities from exercising their right to vote. Partnering with community groups to help break down these barriers is at the center of UU Civ's mission, and it's how we live our UU values of justice, equity, and generosity. We are part of the Voting Access for All Coalition, whose mission is to give a voice to those impacted by the criminal legal system. VAC is a diverse group of organizations and individuals, many of whom are formerly incarcerated. Our legal system has an unequal impact on black communities, so this coalition is doing critical racial justice work. Education is also important, and in the next few weeks, UU Civs is joining forces with the Michigan Unitarian Universalist Social Justice Network and the League of Women Voters of Washtenaw County to co-sponsor presentations about Michigan's expanded voting rights and the National Popular Vote Compact, which, by the way, was introduced in the State House by our very own Representative Carrie Reingens. And here at UUAA, we've joined with uh, restorative justice and other community groups to sponsor a panel discussion on May 8th with the three candidates for Washtenaw County Sheriff. This critical position has a huge impact on equity and fairness within our county. And UU Civs is beginning a postcard campaign that encourages voters who live in states where voting is under attack or suppressed. 
Details for all of these events will be in UUAA's weekly news. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, so please find me in the social hall after the service or email us at uucivs at uuaa, <coughs> excuse me, dot org. I encourage you all to give your civic engagement muscles a workout this year. It feels like a all hands on deck moment. Thank you. Thank you, Lissa. A few weeks ago, we dedicated four children from this community. We blessed them with the elements of the earth, the water, the fire, the air. And we spoke words that reminded us of our commitment to nurture them. Today, we are making similar commitments to our home planet, Earth. Our children's future is undeniably linked to the future of this planet. So if we truly covenant to support the youth, then we must also commit to supporting the planet. And that can seem overwhelming. But because you are part of a community like this one, it is a little bit less overwhelming. There are a lot of folks here who have figured out what we need to do and can help you get started. Lissa gave you several examples already. Committing to voting is also a commitment to our youth and to the planet. After the services today, you can learn all sorts of other ways you can contribute to saving the earth. Right now, one very simple way to start this work is with a financial offering to the work of this congregation. Your gifts support all the programs UUAA offers, including the UU CIVs and the climate justice groups, and in my mind, one of the most fundamental programs, the spiritual growth and development of our children and youth. There are many ways to give. You can text UUAA to 73256. You can give online at uuaa.org slash giving or the device free option of dropping cash or checks in a basket. If you are new or just visiting, it's okay to let the baskets pass you by. Your presence with us is your gift. I invite the ushers to come forward now as today's offering will gratefully be given and received. And I thank you for your generosity.
Thank you, chalice bells, for the rain and the birds and that beautiful music. As the ushers now come forward, will you rise in body or in spirit as we take this moment to recognize with gratitude what this spiritual practice of giving means. It is not something to be taken for granted. So let us speak together the words we use to dedicate our offering to the work of this congregation, which is weaving a tapestry of love and action. We dedicate our lives and these our offerings. Thank you, please have a seat. So we will begin our annual dirt communion ritual. And this year it is paired with something we are calling the tree of action, which Stella will explain in a moment. Now perhaps you gathered some dirt to bring with you today on your way out the door, or perhaps you planned ahead and gathered soil from some place that is meaningful for you, maybe from your garden or a playground, your favorite hiking trail, or maybe from the resting place of someone or something you love. Or maybe, as the first hymn was being sung, you remembered your container of dirt was still on the counter. <laughs> or maybe you just simply forgot. No worries. We have extra dirt here you can use during the ritual. As you add your dirt to the communal pot, reflect on what you hope to nurture in yourself, in others, and what seeds might be planted in you that you hope will grow. Our community has made a commitment to protecting and sustaining, and sustaining the interdependent web of life. We offer space here today to make that commitment tangible. After you've added your dirt to the communal bowl, we invite you to visit one of our trees of action. Each family or household should take a wooden leaf decorated lovingly and with care by our community at Friday Fun Night. And choose one action that you will take in the coming months to care for our Earth. It could be as big as a letter writing campaign to elected officials, or as small as remembering to unplug your appliances. Write it down and hang the leaf or hand it to one of our kids to hang on the branches, so that we may create a visual representation of the awesome power of community. And so when it's time, I will ask any fourth or fifth graders that would like to come up to the behind these tables to help hang the leaves after people have written, you will be welcome to do so. For those of you joining us remotely, I invite you to hold some of the soil you have gathered in your hands. Feel it on your fingers, breathe in its scent, think about its life-giving properties and also take a moment to reflect on what you hope to nurture in yourself and in others. If you have an action you would like to commit to, please share it in the chat if you wish. Know that you can bring the soil to the UUAA and have it added to our pots later, and you're also welcome to write out a leaf and add it to the tree later as well. Now in a moment we will begin our Dirt Communion and Tree of Action ritual. So I invite you to come forward at your own pace, be mindful of those ahead of you, and wait for space to open up at the front table. After you're here, you can move to one of the side tables and fill out um, your action commitment on one of the leaves. Now, if for any reason it's not easy for you to come up to the front, give us a wave, an indication, and we will bring the ritual to you. And remember, we do have extra dirt for you to bring, so everyone is welcome. During the ritual, you'll be able to watch a video called Whispers of Dryads with original music by our congregant Tim Miller and photography by Keith Matz. So let's begin our ritual.
like the open sky where the stars forever have laid. Where the stars, where the stars, where the stars forever have laid. of the old into new. Our dreaming shows us the way. Wondrous our faith settles deep in the earth, rising green to bring a new day. Rising
This dirt we have gathered together today, filled with metaphorical compost and seeds, will live in our outdoor spaces and be a blessing to us always. When I gesture to you like this, please join me in saying, we bless this dirt. In the knowledge that we are all of us imperfect, but come together in communities of grace, we bless this dirt. In the faith that what we compost will lead to new life and what we grow will open up new possibilities, we bless this dirt. In the belief that humans share an origin and a common destiny, we bless this dirt. In a sustaining faith in human redemption and growth, we bless this dirt. In understanding that all living creatures are connected and have a right to healthy earth, we bless this dirt. In honor of the wisdom of trees and forests, we bless this dirt. In hopes that we all continue to grow together in mind, body, and spirit, we bless this dirt. Thank you. This is Methuselah. It's a bristlecone pine tree located in the high Sierra Mountains in California. These gnarled trees grow out of limestone rock and thrive in extreme environments. Hold on, my connection was lost. <laughs> there we go. With high winds, very cold temperatures, and a short growing season. Bristle cone pines only grow in remote elevated areas of Utah, California, and Nevada. Now, Methuselah's precise location is actually under lock and key by the U.S. Forest Service in order to protect it from curious, potentially destructive human visitors. Any guesses as to why that might be? What was it? That's exactly right. It is very likely the oldest tree on planet Earth. Our best dating techniques suggest that Methuselah is 4,855 years old. And yet, Methuselah isn't the oldest tree ever discovered. In 1964, a graduate student named Donald Curry was surveying a grove of whistlecone pines in Wheeler Peak, Nevada, when he stumbled upon a specimen that he suspected might rival Methuselah. Here is a picture of Curry sitting atop the tree, which was called Prometheus. Now Curry knew he'd found another very old tree, but it wasn't until after he and his survey team cut the tree down for research purposes, essentially killing it in the name of science that he realized that this tree was even older than Methuselah by nearly 200 years. Historian Eric Rutko writes in his book, American Canopy, Trees, Forests, and the Making of a Nation. Prometheus was over 5,000 years old at the time of its death. And it turned out to be, quote, the most ancient tree ever discovered. An organism already wizened when Columbus reached Hispaniola, middle-aged when Caesar ruled Rome, and starting life when the Sumerians created mankind's first written language. As a student of history, I love this stuff. The idea that Prometheus and Methuselah were already over 1,500 years old at the start of the Trojan War, and nearly 3,000 years old when Christianity was born. That is so wild. When Stonehenge and the pyramids of Egypt and Peru were under construction, these trees were teenagers. 
Think of all the centuries of human history that passed by while these funky looking trees looked on smugly from their high altitude perches. From Brutkow again, quote, our trees are living history. Each has a story to share, though it is well guarded, locked away in eternal silence. The death of Prometheus, Prometheus was very controversial when it happened, and it led, thankfully, to a slew of protective measures for other bristlecones. But for Prometheus, all that remains is an unmarked stump and a footnote in history. It is still the oldest tree ever discovered. I felt physically pained when I read this story, and I heard physical pain from some of you in the audience when you heard it. But why? I mean, isn't it just a tree? Why does it matter to us that Prometheus was cut down before its natural expiration date? I think its demise feels painful because when we destroy trees, we know that we're destroying part of ourselves and our history. Trees are long lived in general with an average lifespan of three to 400 years. And each one serves to remind us of our own fleeting existence on this planet. Many years ago on an episode of Science Friday on NPR, uh, Ira Flato had a guest on, Alan Alda, who dropped some wisdom that I think about all the time. In a little more than 100 years or so from now, virtually every person on the planet will be gone, replaced by billions of new people. I mean, it's an obvious fact, and yet utterly profound. We will all be gone, but the earth will keep on turning and the trees will keep on growing, some of them for exceptionally long times. We're lucky enough to have several of these record setters here in the United States. In addition to the oldest bristle cones, we also have the giant sequoias, which are the world's biggest trees, led by the biggest of them all, General Sherman. The coastal redwoods, which are the world's tallest trees, led by the towering Hyperion. And the single biggest organism on Earth, which also happens to be a tree species. It's called pando, and that actually is Latin for I spread. It's a forest of about 47,000 aspens in Utah that all originated from a single seed. The specimen clones itself. It covers about 100 acres, weighs 6,600 tons. And the whole thing may be over 80,000 years old. Now, the reason this isn't the oldest is because Methuselah and Prometheus were single organisms, whereas this one is one that can, or were single trees, whereas this one is sort of a single organism, but many trees. We don't get to claim all of the most interesting trees in the world, though. In Mexico, you can visit Arbol del Tul, a cypress tree with the stoutest trunk in the world. The circumference is approximately equal to 10 mid-sized cars parked one in front of the other, or about 30 adults holding hands like this. And on our own property at the UUAA, we have the largest downy hawthorn in the state. So we actually have a champion right here. These outliers of the natural world are very impressive. But there's also deep wisdom in the natural forests, which are remarkable models of mutuality, diversity, and interdependence. According to Peter Wolobin, author of The Hidden Life of Trees, quote, when you know that trees experience pain and have memories, and that tree parents live together with their children, then you can no longer just chop them down and disrupt their lives with large machines. Mother trees find their saplings through their root systems and nurse them with sugar water that they can't make on their own because they have limited access to the sun. The root systems interact with fungi, creating these massive communication networks that function across long distances and even across species. We call this the wood wide web. That's actually what it's called. It was a phrase coined by the journal Nature. And they use this wood wide web to warn one another about predators, to share water and other resources, and to ensure that the differences between the weak and the strong trees are equalized. 
Growing trees can detect other growing trees, and they will limit the scale of their own crown, taking only as much sunlight as they need, no more and no less. And I'm sure many of you see, have seen trees growing around things, finding their way to the sun in any which way around, uh, whether it be other you know, sidewalks or if it's uh, power lines. Trees can detect other things, other living creatures growing around them. Healthy trees take care of sick and elderly trees, recognizing that a tree can only be as strong as the forest that surrounds it. It's a bit like our social security system, created to ensure that no one individual falls through the cracks, because the whole forest loses if they do. Forest ecosystems contain within them the remnants of trees long dead, much like our communities remember those that are no longer with us. And we're learning more every day about how crucial trees are to the fight against human-caused climate change. <laughs> trees have always offered a safe refuge for me, especially when I was little, a space to disappear into my imagination, to escape the pressures and anxieties of growing up. When my introverted self needed a break, I would wander into this small grove of pines, much like the ones in Lori's yard, behind my childhood home and find myself transported into a new world. Or I would climb our magnificent magnolia tree, a wash in bright pink blossoms smelling of heaven, and feel invincible and powerful and almost magical. What is it about trees that inspire us so deeply? From Wollobin again, quote, under the canopy of the trees, daily dramas and moving love stories are played out. Here is the last remaining piece of nature, right on our doorstep, where adventures are to be experienced and secrets discovered. And who knows? Perhaps one day the language of trees will be deciphered, giving us the raw material for further amazing stories." End quote. Yes, trees do talk to one another. There's a reason that trees figure so prominently in religious and spiritual traditions. Before there were churches, temples, or mosques, many people worshiped gods and spirits and natural forces at the feet of trees. As told in the Bible, Adam and Eve lived among the trees in the Garden of Eden, but were tempted by the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and thus cast out into the world. The Quran, the holy book of Islam, warns of the tree of Zakum, which grows in hell, and whose fruit boils the stomachs of sinners. The fig or the Bodhi tree, underneath which the Buddha is said to have meditated for 49 days before achieving enlightenment, is considered sacred in Buddhism and Hinduism, and pilgrims still visit a supposed descendant of that original tree. Then there's Yggdrasil, the Norse tree of life known as the world tree, an enormous ash that supposedly connects nine different worlds and serves as the center of the whole cosmos. Arbol del Tul, the stoutest tree we saw a bit ago, these are my favorites. The indigenous Zapotec people of Oaxaca tell story of its planting by a priest of the god of the wind thousands of years ago. And other local groups believe that this tree took root from the walking stick of a god. Oh, I love that imagery. Trees are a window into the past and the key to a healthy, sustainable future for all of the interdependent web. In Lahaina, on the island of Maui, there sits an historic banyan tree, a member of the fig family, the largest of its kind in the United States. Has anyone ever had, an, had the joy of visiting this tree before? The tree is 150 years old, having been planted in 1873 as an eight-foot sapling. Somewhere in a box, I have pictures of me sitting under this tree when I was a child. Last summer, as we know, Maui, particularly Lahaina, was decimated by wildfire, and the banyan tree was not spared. Here's a before and after aerial shot. It was feared that the tree wouldn't make it. But now, I'm delighted to report that many months later, there is new life growing among the ashes. Like a phoenix, the banyan tree is making a comeback, thanks to the diligent work of botanists and conservationists. Here's what it looks like today. Trees and forests everywhere are suffering the effects of climate change. 
General Sherman, Hyperion, Arbol del Tul, Pando, and Methuselah are all in danger. And consider how catastrophic the loss of these trees would be. I want my children and grandchildren to see these remarkable trees continue to thrive long after I'm gone and long after they're gone. We live in an increasingly isolated digital world, and trees offer us a different path. I return again to Eric Rutkow. Daily life seems alarmingly virtual. Trees provide the antidote. The smell of pine needles, the crunch of autumn leaves, the roughness of bark are all reminders that we are a part of nature. Tree hugging, in its most literal sense, offers a reconnection with the physical world, the world of our forefathers. The forests and trees are a sanctuary for the spirit. To enter them is to seek renewal. May it be so. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and turn in our teal hymnal to hymn number 1064, Blue Boat Home, number 1064. that we have gathered and blessed. We have water from our past water communion ceremonies that connects us to all who have come before. We have a flame from our chalice that links us to UUs all over the world. And we have the air around us that makes it possible for us to sing. We have the earth, the water, the fire, and the air. After the words of benediction, we will carry these elements outside just behind the social hall for a short ceremony to bless the ancestors' grove of trees. A year ago, we prepared for their planting, and today we celebrate their presence and growth. 
Dusty will lead us in the singing and all are welcome to follow him outside. If you choose to stay inside, that is fine. It is kind of chilly out, but you can check everything that is happening in the social hall. That will continue on till about two o'clock this afternoon. Now, before we extinguish the chalice, I will transfer the flame from this to a small lantern. And some of you may recall that's the way we brought the chalice flame to this building from our old building. As you go into the week ahead, remember this. The right time to start your climate commitment is now. Do what you are good at and do your best at it. In the words of climate activist Donella Meadows, there is too much bad news to justify complacency. There is too much good news to justify despair. My friends, leave complacency and despair behind. Go out into this amazing, beautiful, precious world in peace, in love, and with hope in your hearts. May it be so. The Amen. Earth, the water, the fire, the air, return, 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 return. The earth, the water, the fire, the air, return, 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 return. The earth, the water, the fire, the air, return, 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 return. The earth, the water, the fire, the air, return, 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 return. The earth, the water, the fire, the air, return, 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 return. The earth, the water, the fire, the air, return, return, return. Return. The earth, the water, the fire, the air. Return, 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 return. The earth, the water, the fire, the air. Return, 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 return. The earth, the water, the fire, the air. Return.